So one thing that's not in our notes that I thought was useful to include would be evidence for a chemical reaction. So your textbook does list out multiple things that they categorize as, as evidence. To me, two of their rules are the same thing. The formation of a gas and the formation of a solid. This projector is really bright, by the way. This looks nice. I'm not used to that. Um, is really just a change in phase. So if you mix two phases and a new phase appears, that's evidence for a chemical reaction. Okay? Um, so if you mix two liquids and a gas shows up, well, to go from a liquid to a gas, what do you typically have to do? You have to heat it up. If all you did is mix two liquids, well, where did the energy come from to make the gas? From a chemical reaction. So it's a chemical change. Okay, so if we think about those changes in phase, if they aren't things that you force to happen by supplying that energy, then that energy had to come from somewhere or go to somewhere. That's a chemical change. Okay? Uh, the other big one is permanent color changes. So if we look at an image, you can see, in this case, a yellow solid forming. The liquids were both clear liquids. So we now have a yellow substance. That's a permanent color change. Uh, one of the things to be careful of there is not a dilution of color. So if I took white cake frosting and added red food coloring to it, and then I mixed it in, well, now we'd be like, well, that's, that's a color change. It's not a chemical change. It's not a chemical change. It's a physical change. And interestingly enough, believe it or not, you can reverse the mixing of food coloring. Right? It's not easy, but you could theoretically pull that one off. Right? Uh, and then an energy change being observed. Okay, so an energy, if I mix two room temperature liquids and all of a sudden it became hot, well, where did the energy come from to make the solution hot? That was a chemical reaction. So by looking for these kind of key offs, we can decide whether a chemical change occurred and whether we had a chemical reaction. Kind of make sense? I'll take that as a yes. yes. Okay. So in our chemical equations, we're looking at kind of the bulk format. So if we start with two substances, A and B. Notice we've got phase information included in that, gases and liquids. Okay. We have a reaction arrow, so that reaction arrow is effectively an equal sign. Okay. So what we're looking at is potentially, I don't know, 2 plus 2 equaling 4. And everybody says 4. Well, but aren't there two things on the product side of the equation? Okay. So really all that's happening is we're rearranging those pieces to generate something new. And it is possible that we could just add them up and get four, but it is also possible I could have added them up to get three plus one. Okay? It could have been two plus two. Would we say a chemical reaction happened then? Two plus two equals two plus two. Well, those are exactly the same. There really isn't a chemical change. Okay? So this is kind of the hand wavy argument that we could use if we tried to use a mathematical example for this. Okay? So lots of information gets put into our chemical equations. We can see the reactants being on the left hand side of that arrow, products on the right hand side of that arrow, yeah. Our phases, gas, liquid, solid, and aqueous, dissolved in water. Nearly everything you do is dissolved in water. Why? <laughs> the best, the most. It's not the best. It's the most accessible, so it's kind of the cheapest solvent to run a reaction in. If you moved into organic chemistry, we use lots of other solvents because water does all sorts of other reactions that we don't want it to do, okay, or that we don't want happening. But in general chemistry, water works really, really well as a bulk solvent. Okay, so you get your arrows, plus signs, reactants, or added to, or also a product. Okay, the big one that she noted on her slides um, was looking at catalysts and heat. Okay, so heat is oftentimes written as a delta symbol. What does delta mean? Change. It's change. So when we see that delta, really what we're saying is change in temperature. And because it's written over the arrow, that's something that we are putting into it. Okay, so I am putting something in to cause the temperature to change. So that's me heating up the reaction or theoretically cooling it down. Okay? 
The other thing, notice here we have Fe over the arrow. Well, what is Fe? Iron. So in this case, we're adding iron to the reaction. It's important to cause the reaction to occur. That's why it's there. But it's not a reactant. It's not a product. It's just there to facilitate that process. Has anybody tried to start a fire before? Like controlled, reasonable fire? One person has tried to start a fire. Seriously? Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, to do that, what do you need? You take a match, and you take something that needs to burn. You put the match near the thing that needs to burn, and poof, you've got a fire. Well, you can also use your glasses and a mirror. Okay, glasses and a mirror. Okay. Does that require a little bit of skill to actually get the fire to go? Like if you're building a campfire, you just hold a match up to a block of wood and it just lights on fire. No. What else could we add to that to make that process easier? We could add oxygen. Another suggestion. We could add gasoline. Gasoline now acts as the catalyst to help getting our fire started, okay? It's not, again, a perfect example because officially our catalysts are not consumed nor are they produced in the course of the reaction, okay? Um, yeah, that's what she's got there for her reactions, okay? So the next part, let's look at a chemical reaction. So theoretically, you guys have already done nomenclature, right? So given this sentence, you should be able to convert this into a chemical equation. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? Should, should you take a second and see what you guys can come up with? No. No, yeah, we don't want to do that. Okay. It's not like you just took, a, took an exam. Okay. Sodium. What do you know sodium is? Na. Na. This one's a little bit harder. Hydride. Technically not hydrogen, it's hydrogen with an extra electron, so it changes its charge. It is still H, so it looks like hydrogen, but the, we call it something else because it has an extra electron. We notice we also have the solid. Where does the solid go? It came first in our sentence, so we should put the solid out here, right? No. no, that looks a little bit weird. That could look like it's sulfur. How can we make sure that it doesn't look like sulfur? put parentheses around it, and we now have our solid phase. Okay, kind of makes sense? So we could theoretically go through and do this with each and every one of these pieces. One of the important aspects to get out of this is that once we've written this formula down, what do we have to verify to be true? That that formula is indeed correct by balancing out the charges. So you would have to know the charges on each of those pieces. For instance, sodium was plus one, and hydride was? Negative. Negative one. Right? And our formula was correct. Once we have that formula, we could continue through that process. Hydrogen is a little bit of a tricky one. I had to use it for this example, so sorry. Okay? So, ta-da! Look at that. There it is. Okay? Depending on what Miss Chris expects from you, you might be required to be able to do that whole system. I, and I, I, I can't verify that one way or another, um, but I'm pretty sure you should be able to do that whole thing. Okay? So there's our equation out of it. Okay? Does anybody notice anything weird in it that you're like, ah, what, what happened? Why did that, why did it do that? Okay? I got a G over here, I've got a gas. Okay? Remember, what we were copying was the sentence. What did the sentence say it was? Hydrogen. Hydrogen gas. So I don't have to know why that came in as a gas or why any of those were aqueous or solids. Okay? That's kind of outside of the realm of my need for knowledge because it's already there. I'm just told to copy that in. So you all know why when we write hydrogen, we write it as H2? Uh, helium is also a gas, right? If I ask for helium gas, what's its symbol? So your theory, awesome, it's a gas, so it's H2. Helium counters that. So no. Why is there a 2? No. 
and also no. At no point have we talked about balancing the equation yet. This is content that we would need to know before we balance the equation. Better, but not necessarily. Hydrogen is a special element. When we talk about hydrogen on its own, it is always diatomic. There's always two elements or two atoms that are connected. It has to come as H2. If I want just H, what do I have to say? I could say monoatomic hydrogen. That's a really fancy word. Or I could say a single hydrogen atom. Okay? Or just a hydrogen atom. That's now directly only referencing one hydrogen atom. Anytime I say hydrogen gas, I'm now saying two hydrogens. Okay? So we have to be careful on that. Are there other elements that also do that? Oxygen, oxygen does it. Is that it? Just hydrogen and oxygen? Well, that's not bad. Okay. Not carbon, what would you say? I said there's like six others. There's six others. There's a whopping total of seven of them. Okay. So you need to memorize those seven. We've got hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, halogens, or sorry, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, just called as our halogens. There's a couple different ways that you could potentially memorize that. Again, I don't know what she expects, but I would presume that she does expect you to have that memorized. So let's look through a couple simple ways to do it. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Looks like what number? Seven. A seven, but how many elements are circled? Six. Six. Whoops. I forgot one. Okay. So there we go. The seven plus one. There we it. There it is. Those elements are all diatomic. Whenever we talk about nitrogen gas, it's N2. When I talk about oxygen gas, it's O2. Okay? Always. The only time it's not is when I say oxygen atom or chlorine atom. Okay? Kind of make sense? And there are no others. That's it. Just those seven. Okay? The other device for this is that a colleague of mine used to play hockey. Anybody seen a hockey stick? You've got a hockey stick, and what do you play hockey with? And don't tell me just hockey sticks. You also have a puck. So there you go. Okay. For whatever reason, high school for me, have no fear of ice-cold beer. You get a little mnemonic device, H, hydrogen, and nitrogen, fear, fluorine, O, oxygen. However you memorize it is up to you. Ultimately, you will probably need to have those memorized. It's one of those things that just gets used commonly enough that you'll probably memorize it anyway. Okay? And that's why I would say you're probably going to be expected to have it memorized as well. Okay? So, balancing chemical reactions. Now that we actually have correct formulas, now we can balance the reaction. Okay? And in balancing, just like with our equation, okay, we said this was roughly the same as 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus 1. Well, could I have said 2 plus 2 equals 1 plus 3? Yeah, that's still fair. Could I have said 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus 3? No. Those don't balance. We're doing the same thing with our chemical formulas. We have to make sure that each of the atoms on each side of the equation balance out. If they don't balance out, our equation becomes invalid and we can't use it for anything. Okay. The further through chem you'll get, the more you need to be able to use the equation. So we have to make sure they're balanced. So how can we make sure they're balanced? Basically, you count out each element and the number and make we sure they're Count out each element. So sodium. How many times does sodium show up on the left-hand side of the equation? Once. Once. On the right-hand side? Once. Once. Okay. And this is where it can then get tricky. What element should we balance next? Okay. How many times does hydrogen show up on the left-hand side of the equation? There's one. There's another one. And there's three. So we get a total of five. How many times does hydrogen show up on the right-hand side of the equation? There's three. 
there's two, we get five. Okay? What's the next thing we could do? Carbon. carbon. How many carbons on the left? Two. Two carbons on the right? Two. Oxygen? Two. Two and two. What does that mean? It's balanced. It's balanced. So that was nice. We were given an equation that was outright balanced. We don't have to do anything to it. Okay? So how could we ask a question about this? Because I noticed your exams were multiple choice. Okay? I didn't have to necessarily show any work, but how would I ask a question that could get at the fact that you balanced it? Ask whether or not it's balanced. Could ask whether the equation is balanced. Multiple choice. Here's four questions or four equations. Which of these is balanced? That's a, we could ask you to balance it. Does that work for a multiple choice? Well, if I ask you, you to balance option. this, yeah. okay. well, true or false. we could do a true or false. That is a possibility. The common one that comes up is what is the coefficient in front of sodium acetate? Well, what? One. Okay. So sodium acetate, sodium is? Na, so it shows up in a couple different places. And then I said acetate. What is acetate? It is C2H3O2, which you just did nomenclature. Theoretically, maybe you had that memorized. Or you had the little sheets, right? You could have looked up on the sheet what the acetate was. Okay? So we know that when we're asking this question, what is the coefficient in front of sodium acetate, or the coefficient for sodium acetate, if we want to give you less information, that we're referencing this compound, okay? Where's the coefficient specified? The coefficient is always directly in front of it. Well, what is written there? Nothing. What is the mathematical symbol for nothing? One. Zero. Zero. If that is a zero, what is zero times anything? Zero. Zero, which would mean zero. this thing didn't exist. Mm. Can it be zero? No, what is it? One. It's an implied one. Okay. So sometimes when we write nothing, we mean zero. Sometimes when we write nothing, we mean one. Okay. Why? Because it's less confusing if we were more specific in all of those things. What was your original question? What is the coefficient? <laughs> what is the coefficient for sodium acetate? Okay. Okay. And our answer would now be one. Is that asking how many atoms of... Nope. All it's... Uh, so coefficient, coefficient just means the number in front. That's it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. It is not the number of atoms, because now you're looking at a formula, which doesn't work. Okay. We could ask the number of atoms. How, in the balanced equation, how many carbon atoms show up on the left-hand side of the equation? Okay. The only way we would do that is balance the equation, recognize that it's balanced, and now say, well, carbon, left-hand side of the equation, is 2. Does that make sense? Okay. The last one that usually gets people, what is the sum of the coefficients of the balanced equation? Four. Why four? <laughs> sum of the coefficients. So the coefficient is every number in front. What's the number in front of sodium hydride? One. 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 There's four ones. The sum of the coefficients is four. four. Very easy to ask a multiple choice because we can provide an unbalanced equation and one of your answers almost guaranteed is just the sum of ones all the way across. Why is it one? Is it because there's just one thing that's sitting there? There's only one thing specified. So what other number could it be? So let's try that. What if I put a 2 in front of sodium hydride? Is the equation balanced? No. No, because no, now the sodiums don't balance out. What if I put a 0? Okay, then it wouldn't be balanced. But then also, why would I put a 0 there? Putting a 0 there means that thing isn't there. Okay? Is an elephant in this equation? No. So really, I could also include... There's my little elephant. Every time I balance equation, I have to draw an elephant and write zero next to it. That, 
I probably should have had the elephant face the other direction. Okay? Is hafnium in this reaction? No. Well, if that number in front means zero, then what else do I have to include here? I have to write hafnium with a zero in front of it. Okay? If it meant zero, our equation just became really nasty. Okay? So it has to mean one. Okay? Unless I specify another number, which we will see. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So the process for doing this is exactly what we went through and did. We identify each of the elements, and we go through and balance how much shows up on each side of the equation. Sometimes it's awesome, and it's already balanced. Sometimes it's not, and you have to go through a balancing process. Okay. My general rule, yeah, skip that. My general rules are here. So this is how I would go through and balance. Notice the very first thing that we'll have to do is predict products, if necessary. Some equations you're required to predict products for. Some, at least in my class, you are. Some equations you're not. Okay? Again, that detail is something that you should have to nuance with Miss Grace when she gets back, because okay? maybe she'll expect more or less. Okay? Um, predicting products usually comes in because you're classifying the type of reaction. So when you look at a chemical reaction, you will have to say that is a combination reaction. That is a double replacement. That universally you're going to have to do. Okay? Then you have to make sure that your formulas are correct. Okay? So when we looked at sodium or at hydrogen gas, we didn't just say it was H gas. We said it was H2. The formula is now correct. Once the formula is correct, now what can I do? Now I can start to balance the equation. Okay? Those first two steps very often get forgotten by students, and they will then initiate into the balancing of the equation because the question said balance the equation, and so they just start balancing the equation. And what you can find is that there are cases where you will end up in a never-ending loop, where you will constantly be changing numbers and constantly changing numbers. You're like, why is this not balancing? It's not balancing because you didn't do the first two rules right. Okay? And that's if you're lucky, because if you're unlucky, you didn't do the first two rules right, and all of a sudden it magically balances. Well, it's balancing with incorrect information, which means your final answer was also wrong. Okay? So you have to make sure those first two things are correct, which is ultimately coming from some new concept, what are chemical reactions, some old concept, nomenclature, okay? and then new stuff actually balancing chemical reactions. One of the things that's nice in chemical reactions, except for that rare case where you massively screwed up, you will know you got it right or wrong because it all balances out or it goes in a never-ending loop. Okay? With those two circumstances, you either know on the test, God, I'm going through a never-ending loop. This is wrong. Okay? Or it balanced. I think I'm right. Okay? So it's, it's pretty nice in that respect. Almost all of it, you need to go through and check your work. Okay? My general rule of, of thumb for this is that you should go through and check your work until you are irritated, and because I'm the one now teaching you, until you are irritated personally at me for making you check your work. And it goes, why would you want students to get mad at you? Because if you get mad, you've brought emotion into the knowledge or into the chemistry, and you remember it better. Okay? As long as you don't get so mad that you hate chemistry as an overarching <laughs> role, be, because then you're now spiting me to do bad. <laughs> Just enough hate so that you learn it better. Okay? Careful balance. Make sense? Okay. So, chemical reactions. So, we've got some examples that we could go through and look at. Okay. I thought that was touch. That was a nice touch, wasn't it? <laughs> Okay, so her first example, I'll go ahead and start writing up the examples. You can start working on trying to balance them. Uh, where I'm looking at is still on the front page. It's actually the very first examples. No, no, no. The very first examples. It's like at the very, very top. Halfway through between the first two Underbalancing things. Equations? Underbalancing equations. Yes. Underbalancing equations. 
Um, she did not write them in for you. You have to write them in. This would have been a good time to pause the lecture recording. Oh well. Yeah. The problem with pausing it is I have to remember to unpause it. Anybody try and balance the first one yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if we went through and look at that first one, okay. I'm not a fan of showing work off to the side, but because I just listed them like this, this is how we're going to have to do it. Okay. So we'll say this is our reaction arrow. I usually put the element I'm balancing directly underneath the arrow. Okay, so hydrogen for the first equation. How many on the left? Two. 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 On the right? Two. Two. Cool, it's balanced. Okay. You, need to you have to do all the elements. Oxygen. Two. Oh, you're right. Sorry. And one. one. Oxygen's not balanced. Okay, so here's our first case where we have to go through and balance. We have to make sure that oxygen comes out as two. Okay. One of the most common things students will go through and do is then say, well, I need a 2 there. No. That is now balanced. Yeah. That is true. No. But you change the chemical reaction. Okay. So if this whole process was trying to make water so that you could live on Mars, you just now killed everybody on Mars. Because instead of producing water, you produced hydrogen peroxide. That's not a good thing for humans to drink. Okay? So we need to change the coefficient. Because our product has already been established, the only thing I can change now is the coefficient, which is the number in front. The number in front of what? In front of water. In front of the compound that contained oxygen. Because there's no space to put a two. Whoa, that's an eraser. There's no space to put a 2 in there. Okay? The 2 has to come out front. That 2 now applies to everything after it up to a mathematical operator, like a plus sign. Okay? So it's going to refer to the oxygen, which then means how many oxygens are in or on the left-hand side of the equation. We now have 2. Phenomenal. This is, again, where students tend to go, oh, cool, I've done it, and I'm now done, and I can just add everything up. This is why you have to go back and check your work. Okay? So in checking your work, we should start the whole process again. Hydrogen, how many on the left? Two. Two on the right? Four. Now there's four. I have the two that applies directly forward. I also have the two that applies backwards. So I have two H2 molecules, which means there's a total of four. Is my hydrogen balanced? No. So what do I need to do? Two in front of the hydrogen. I now need a two in front of the hydrogen on the left-hand side. Okay? That increases the two on the left to now a four. You can get rid of it, one of the hydrogen on the other side. What part of the equation can you not mess with? You can't mess with anything right now in red. Once you have the compound, the compound must be left alone. Okay. So you need to add more of them or take away more of them, but you have to leave the actual You have to leave yeah, the actual compound. The actual yep. Because otherwise you're changing the identity of the species. Which, if you're told to balance an equation, changing the identity of what you're being asked is a bad thing. That's like if I ask you what color my shirt is, and you say brown. Well, you're right, because you answered the question about my shoes. I didn't ask about my shoes, I asked about my shirt. Right? So changing the identity of the question alters fundamentally the whole process, and you end up getting wrong. Okay? So the only thing you can change is what's in front. Make sense? Okay. And now the coefficient for? Hydrogen gas would be 2. Right? 
We still aren't done because we have to go back and look at oxygen. How many oxygens on the left? Two, two on the right? Yep. Two. So the oxygens were balanced. What should we now go through and do? Check it again. You get to check it again. Okay? And if we go through and check all our work again, there's our reaction arrow. Hydrogen on the left? Four, four on the right? Four. four. Oxygen on the left? Two. Oxygen on the right? Two. two. Do you have to put the arrows? All the ele elements balanced out. Okay? Does that make sense first? And then I'll get to you. Okay. Do you need to show the arrows? So I'm going to guess the arrows you're talking about would be my red and blue arrow? No. The only reason those arrows are getting added in there is so that you see reference on why I'm changing those numbers. Does that make sense? So this has nothing to do with balancing like the electrons that we've done before. This is just talking about the number of atoms we have in the problem. To get to this, what has to be true? The original red? Each of those individual compounds. Well, how do you know each of those individual compounds was correct? Because you balanced all the charges. And that is step one. Okay? If you're given a full equation like any of these and told to balance the equation, it is probably acceptable to just start balancing immediately. Okay? Because why would we give you an equation and say, balance this equation and then screw something up internally? Yeah. Okay. Theoretically, we could do that. I it's might have been known to do that just to mess with people <laughs> unintentionally. Okay? Um, but if we're giving you the full equation, it's probably already set up correctly. You just have to balance things out. Right? If you got in that point where you started cycling, you should check for that. But does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, when they ask the coefficient question, will it always include like the like what it means? So uh, what is the coefficient for hydrogen gas? Or what is the coefficient for water? Okay, so let's make it a multiple choice question. What is the coefficient for hydrogen gas? Answer choices that you would undoubtedly see. A, 1, B, 2, C, 3. Because it looks like you guys only go up to D. I'm going to say 5. All right. So the question was, again, what is the coefficient for hydrogen gas? In the balanced equation, it's 2. Why did I write 1? If I didn't balance the whole process, your answer right out of the gate was one. Can you make sure it's balanced before you even answer the question? Exactly right. Okay. Why three? What is two plus one? Three. Three. Why five? Two plus one plus two. Every single one of those multiple choice answers are a valid answer to a question that could be asked about this. Make sure you answer the question that is asked, not the question you want to. My shirt is purple, not brown. Does that make sense? But doesn't that mean that the, um, the whole thing is not balanced, like the composition numbers? Or, I'm sorry, not the right term, but you know. All of these are valid answers to this balanced question, right. this properly balanced equation. One, it was not properly balanced. B, C, and D are all valid answers to a question that could be asked about the balanced equation. I could say, what is the coefficient on hydrogen? Answer is B. What is the sum of the coefficients for the reactants? For the reactants. What are your reactants? H2 and O2 are reactants because they're on the left-hand side of the arrow. The coefficient for hydrogen is 2. The coefficient for oxygen is one, my answer is three. What is the sum of the coefficients for the entire equation? Five. Every single answer is a valid answer for some level of understanding within it. You have to make sure you answer the correct question. Okay? Some people get more nitpicky in that question answer process than others. I tend to be very detailed within it. I heard a so, no. So I'm just wondering, so originally we started out with two hydrogen, two oxygen. So it was a one plus one or a two plus two? Like whenever we were doing it, like if you, because then I'm like, you have four when you're starting out. Right? So before we balance the equation, 
What did we put in as our coefficients? What color were they? They were blue. Right? So it was just the red thing. Okay. Kind of make sense? Yes. So the reactants are on the left side of yep. the equation, left side of the arrow. What, what are the things called on the right side of the equation? Products. On the Products. Right Products, okay. Thank you. Make sense? Okay. Next one. Because I got space, I'm going to go up. How many aluminums on the left? One. Aluminums on the right? Two. Two. Is it balanced? No. No. What do you need to do? I need to put a two in front of the aluminum. Not that. Make sense? So my one just became two. What's the next thing I balance? Copper. How many coppers on the left? One. Coppers on the right? <coughs> one. So that was already balanced. What's the next thing I balance? Ooh, I heard two suggestions. Okay, we're going to jump just straight to the cheat on this. I can balance this as SO4. I don't have to balance it as sulfur and oxygen. Why can I do that? It's not even necessarily that it's polyatomic. What happened to SO4 in the course of this reaction? I see SO4 and I see SO4. What happened to it? It stayed the same. The amount changed, but the identity of the species didn't change, which means I can balance based off the identity of the species. Okay, so how many sulfates showed up on the left? Say that again? Four. I heard a suggestion for four. And now I've got a suggestion for one. What is the meaning of the four? Four oxygens. Four oxygens. Are four oxygens necessary to make this sulfate? Yes. Just like that U is what makes that copper. Am I allowed to just delete the U? then it becomes carbon. That four is what makes that sulfate. It's not the amount of sulfates, it's what makes it sulfate. So it is one unit. How many of that unit is present on the left-hand side of the equation? Only one. How many of that unit is shown on the right-hand side of the equation? Three. How do we know it was three? The three applies to whatever's in the parentheses. What's in the parentheses? sulfate, SO4, which means on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got three. three. All right. How many do I have on the left? One. So it's not balanced. What do you need to do? Again, we can only change the coefficient. So the three goes out in front of that whole unit. That becomes three. My sulfate's now balanced. Now what do we do? I don't want to say jump into that yet. I want to go check my work, which means because I've got the ability to do so, I can just erase all of my work, and I can start the process again. How many aluminums? Two and two. How many coppers on the right-hand side of the equation? On the right-hand side of the equation? One. Just trying to mess with you. Answer the question that's asked. Copper on the left? Three, is it balanced? No. What do you need to do? I need a three on the other side. Okay. Sulfates? On what side is an interesting question. You held off. Does it matter for sulfate? At this point, no, because we have the three on the left hand side applying backwards which means I get three sulfates on the left. On the right, what do I have? Three. three sulfates, no coefficient in front of the aluminum, so there's only three. It doesn't actually matter which one we picked. Because we changed a number in our balancing sequence, notice that whole little arrow with our copper, you should go back and check your work. Okay? I would recommend, again, you check your work till you're angry, okay? or you check your work until you've stopped changing numbers. Because if you stopped changing numbers, 
You've either done a massive mistake or you're done. Those are really the only two options. Okay, and if you made a massive mistake, you probably weren't going to catch it by just cycling through the same process. So in the aluminum, we used, when we saw the AL2 on that side, we assumed there was two to balance out the two on this side. But when we did... No. No? That is a very important point. <laughs> okay, so let's walk through that again. You said the two, uh -huh. that black two, uh -huh. was there to balance out the two aluminum. Okay, so a couple of things. Number one, that's backwards. The black two was there first. The blue two came in second. Okay. The next part, the black two has nothing to do with the blue two. Really? Yep, completely and utterly meaningless. Why do I have the black two? Well, it's part of that compound, right? I have the black two so that aluminum balances sulfate. Okay. So then how okay. do we why did I get a 2 in front of the aluminum? Okay. This is where looking at the end stage of the work, you're like, I don't understand where these numbers came from. Wind back. All the way back, we said we started with this equation. What did I try and balance? The aluminum. How many aluminums on the left? How many aluminums on the right? So right there. Okay, there are two over here. Okay, that two is there because it's balancing sulfate. That's it alone. But there's two aluminums here. How many aluminums on the left? One. But so my question is, when you go to the sulfate and we use the four right there, why wouldn't we give that four also on the? Did we ever use the four for sulfate? It never was used. It's part of it, but that's the same thing with the aluminum. That's part of that, right? That nope, two. nope, 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 nope. The two is not part of what makes this aluminum. Okay, if I erased everything from the screen, and I may regret this. I hope I don't. Let's try that. Uh, nope, that didn't work. Undo. No, I can't undo that. So let's try this. Boom. <laughs> Write the formula for aluminum. No, seriously. Write the formula for aluminum. I didn't say aluminum ion. Write the formula for aluminum. AL. Is it AL2? No, it's AL. Write the formula for sulfate. Sulfate's trickier. Sulfate has to have the negative 2 because sulfate is always a charged species. Aluminum isn't always charged. So if I asked for aluminum, you'd write AL. If I asked for sulfate, you write SO4 minus 2. Uh, can I do Please come back. Yay. Uh, yay. Why is the black 2 there? For the aluminum to balance sulfate. Okay. Why is the 4 for sulfate there? To make sulfate. Two entirely different meanings, but a number placed in the exact same location. Right, okay. I know what okay. you're saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to be very, very careful on why our numbers are written there. When are we done in here? 11.13. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So people standing outside can deal with it. Okay. Well, usually in the lab, usually done early, soon. Yeah. you guys have lab over there or here? Over there. Over, over there. there. Okay. 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 Yeah, we usually get done. They're usually done. They do online. They do online. It's oh. just because we have the test. Well, but we have our time till 11.15. Yeah. Uh, I don't I could care less what they want. We're, we're in here till 11.15. <clears throat> right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, got Sorry. I can be somewhat rude, too. So. <laughs> Next one. Oh, God, that's pretty sloppy. Where do we start? Checking to see with what? Hydrogen. hydrogen. How many hydrogens on the left? Two. Two. How many hydrogens on the right? Two. Okay. Just because we had this question, purple two. Everybody see the purple two? Yeah. And black two. Do those twos mean the same thing? Yes. No. I'm going to say no. 
No. They mean entirely different things. What does the purple two mean? It just means Hydrogen is a diatomic element. I need a two. What does the black two mean? I need two hydrogens to balance oxygen. Same number, same place, two different meanings. Okay? And that's where you have to be very, very careful when you deal with your chemical formulas to make sure you apply those appropriately. And ultimately, all of those chemical formulas come out of nomenclature. So understanding what happened within nomenclature plays a really big role with everything else. Kind of, sort of? Okay, mm -hmm. so, next thing. Iron. iron. How many irons? Three and one. Three and one. How do we fix it? I'll put a three in front. Remember, since I'm now balancing the equation, I can only balance the coefficient. What's the next thing? Oxygen. Oxygen. How many oxygens? Four. Four and one. And one. Is that balanced? No. no, what do I do? Okay, I need a four in front of the water. I've changed now multiple numbers. This should be a giant red flag that this equation is not yet balanced, and I need to go back and check my work, and I check my work by erasing everything and doing it again. Hydrogen's on the left. Two. Two on the right? Eight. Eight, is that balanced? No. What do I need to do? You need to put a four in front of the hydrogen. hydrogen. I have the black two applying forward to the hydrogen, and I have the blue four applying backwards. So if we write that out long ways, H2O, there's one, but I have four of them. H2O, H2O, H2O. How many hydrogens in the first top one? Two, and the next one. Two, and the next one, two, and the next one is two, plus, plus, plus. How do we do repetitive addition? Multiplication. Multiplication. This is two times four. Okay. Where are we? Oh, because we restarted. Yeah, sorry. So we need a four in front of that hydrogen. Yeah? So far? Yes, so far? Next one. Iron is balanced three and three and three. Three and three, oxygen? And four and four. Four and four. Did we change a number? Yes. We did. Which means? We gotta check it again. You do it again. <laughs> okay. So we erase all our internal work and we go through the process again. Hydrogen on the left. <clears throat> We have the two applying to the hydrogen. The four also applies backwards. This is our repetitive addition, four times two. Please reconnect. <coughs> we have eight on the left, on the right. Eight. eight. Next symbol. Iron, Iron. Iron. left, three. Three. three and three. Oxygen, four. Four. four and four. What do we now have? Balanced, balanced chemical equation. What is the sum of the coefficients? Two for all of them. Eight and eight, sixteen. Try that again. Four plus one. Five plus three. Eight plus four. Twelve. It's okay. Makes sense. Okay. So I'm going to skip the next one. Okay. Classifying chemical reactions. This is every single one of your chemical or types of chemical reactions. Uh, she's got these outlined equally on your sheet in, I believe, the same fashion. All right. So what we're trying to do is come up with patterns behind what's happening behind these. And a combination reaction. What did I start with? which would be A would be one thing, B would be a second thing. So I start with at least two things, and it becomes one thing. Okay? I don't care about the identity of any of those things within it. A could be a 50 million elements, B could, it wouldn't be, but 50 million elements, 
the product A, B is now some combination of those. Right? None of these are necessarily balanced at this stage. These are just blanket kind of statements. Decomposition. If I all of a sudden started decomposing right now, what would it look like? Kind of messy and gruesome because what might happen? Stuff would happen. My arm falls off. My nose slides off my face. Those things are disconnecting that should not be disconnecting. One unit becomes necessarily two. It could be more, but we're looking at multiple pieces. Okay? Our single replacements are usually the exchange of metals. Okay? So I start with a metal all by itself and then a metal in a compound. If the reaction occurs, I exchange those pieces. Okay? So now we actually have some identity coming into these patterns. It's not just one piece becomes two or two pieces become one. We're now saying what's changing in these. Can I tell a difference between a single replacement and a decomposition? Yes, how? Both of them end with two things, guys. I can't tell a difference. The beginning part. What's the beginning part? Come on now. That would be the reactants. When we look at the reactants, for a single replacement, how many reactants do I have? Two. Two. For a decomposition, how many reactants do I have? One. So looking for those patterns can help you approach and classify your chemical reactions. Okay? Double replacements, similar to single replacements, except instead of a metal being all on its own, okay, it comes in with something else. So the horrible analogy I used in another class, this is horrible, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> me with my first girlfriend. That was an awful situation. So what happened? My wife came along and said, get out of that, and we switched. Okay. I, I made it somewhat nice. Okay. It, it, it only gets worse. <laughs> If we extend that, you get two couples coming along and being like, actually, I like your spouse better. Let's trade. Okay? So that's effectively what's going on within those if we want to compare those out. Okay? Neutralization reactions. Does a neutralization look kind of difficult to discern from the double replacement? H-A-B-O-H. What happens? Guess what? A neutralization is a double replacement. She calls them acid base. Okay. They are one and the same. Okay. Sort of. Is a rectangle a square? No. Is a square a rectangle? What is a rectangle? A shape with four sides. Is a square a rectangle? Yes but a rectangle is not a square. The same thing is happening here. Neutralizations are double replacements. Double replacements are not necessarily neutralizations. Okay? For it to be a neutralization, what extra thing has to be going on? As a potential hint, back to nomenclature, I guess you all did really well on that part of the exam. I have an aqueous species that also starts with hydrogen, known as oh, acid. an acid. Okay. What has to be true for an acid-base reaction? I better have an acid. Okay. I have to have an acid. That's a neutralization. Do I have to have an acid for double replacement? No. No. Okay. So again, looking for the patterns and similarities can help you out. The last one is a combustion reaction. Uh, she got even less detailed than I probably would have. Um, well, she actually did better because she included it, and I always forget it. You're taking a carbon-containing compound. Okay. It's usually carbon with hydrogen. You react it with oxygen gas, and you produce carbon dioxide and water. When do you produce carbon dioxide and water? when it's a combustion reaction. Okay. So what are the products for all combustion reactions? 
carbon dioxide and water. Okay? That's why those are specified as hard formulas and not as generic pieces. Does that make sense? All right. So one of the things that you will now be doing is going through and looking at each of those types of reactions, being able to classify them. Once you've classified them as that type of reaction, what should you do with them? Once you have classified a chemical reaction, what should you do with that chemical reaction? You need to go back and balance the chemical reaction. Okay? So you have that packet. I'll try and go through a couple examples for each of those. Um, sorry, I was trying to get to this thing. It's okay. That's what I was trying to find. You have this sheet, which is your practice, your homework. Okay? Balancing chemical equations. So it starts off with whatever that is, 21 questions on balancing, okay? The next one is classifying your chemical reactions. You're getting practice with looking at a specific chemical reaction and trying to match it to the patterns for each of those classifications. The last one is more balancing because you can never have enough balancing, okay? Balancing becomes very important because you need a balanced chemical equation to actually work with it, which is the next unit after that, which is looking at how do we quantify each of these chemical reactions. Okay? So all the conversion stuff you guys did early on in the semester, right? You did that? Conversions? Yeah. Metric? Yeah. You'll now apply them to chemical reactions. Okay? So combination reactions... Okay, your textbook gives you three different kind of rules behind them. Okay. Again, you should discuss with Miss Grace the details of it, but in general, combination reactions you aren't expected to predict except for very special narrow circumstances. Okay. Um, and that's because ultimately it's hard to know the charges on all of the different things. For instance, if I react iron with oxygen, okay, so we can follow that very first example. Reaction of a metal with oxygen, Fe, right? Right? Right. Yeah, good. With oxygen, which would be? Would it be O? It would be O2, because it's one of the diatomics. It's the of in my little phrase. To produce. Well, it's a combination. I have to combine iron with the oxygen. Can you name this compound for me? Iron oxide is wrong. And you might be getting into the ferric and ferrous, which I might have heard, or there were some other F words dropped. No. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, I would, I, to, personally, I would avoid that. What's our other rule? What else could we bring in? Instead of ferric and ferrous? Roman numerals? We would say Roman numeral 2, right? So it would be iron 2 oxide. Is that also a potential product from iron reacting with oxygen? Does that fit the pattern of a combination? Why did I get the 3? Why is this formula now different? Because the iron is now not iron 2, this compound is iron 3 oxide. Well, if I ask you to predict the product of reacting iron with oxygen, which product am I expecting you to predict? The one with iron plus 3 or the one with iron plus 2? You don't know as a student which to pick. So it becomes very difficult to expect you to predict products in a combination reaction. We have to get very, very careful with the examples that we pick. Do, do, do. Or she picked some other ones. Let's see. Do, do, do. Yeah, that's a dangerous one. Oh, and she calls it out as a dangerous one. That's good. Um, so I'll just give you a different one. Lithium plus oxygen gas. Should you be able to predict this one? So this now needs to be what? Lithium oxide, right? Why has it become lithium-2 oxide? 
charge on lithium is a plus one. The charge on oxygen is a negative two. The lowest common multiple between two and one is two. How do I make the one a two? I need two of them. How do I make the two a two? I just need one. Okay? Now that I have my product, now I could balance the equation. Okay? And with a little bit of speed, we'd find we'd have that balanced chemical equation. Okay? So sometimes combinations you're expected to predict products on, sometimes not. I blanket statement just say you aren't expected to predict them. You, you're expected to recognize them as a combination reaction and balance them once you're told what the products are. Okay? She does have more examples. I can provide more examples a little bit later, but she's got a lot of stuff here, so I kind of feel like I should get through to some of the bigger stuff that requires a little bit more memorization. Decomposition, same kind of thing as our combinations. <clears throat> we aren't expected to predict products necessarily. The textbook provides more context. A metal carbonate decomposes to give a metal oxide and carbon dioxide. We're told that. So if I have calcium carbonate, am I expected to be able to predict the product now? Calcium is a metal, so it fits the rule that I'm given. I could go through and say calcium carbonate produces a metal oxide, calcium oxide, and carbon dioxide. Okay? Is that equation balanced? Oh, snap. Yeah, it was. Cool. Okay? So given that extra information, I can predict products. If I'm not given that extra information, it has to come from somewhere. Based on my interactions and what I've seen from what Miss Grace expects of you, I don't think she expects you to memorize those. Okay? I, I think she expects you to be able to look at this reaction and say, it's, it's if it's balanced and what is it? It's a decomposition. Does that make sense? Okay, so single replacement. All right, so what I'm going to go through and do is look at my equation and say, where's the most similar thing? Zinc is a metal. PB is lead, which is a metal. Sulfur, non-metal oxygen, non-metal. We have a big argument that sulfur and oxygen should not be called out as sulfur and oxygen. Instead, that should be called out as sulfate as its own unit, right? So when I went through and did that, I labeled these two as metals. So if I'm going to go through this reaction, I'm going to exchange those two most common pieces. So I'm going to get lead by itself, followed by Zinc now with sulfate. Okay? Some things that come out of this, okay, that we could just go through a straight memorization. What was the phase on zinc? Solid. 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 What do you think the phase on lead is going to be in the product? Solid. Solid. Do it as a full exchange. Okay? So the phase changes on it too. What is the phase on zinc sulfate? We'll run it as aqueous for this moment. All right? We could go through and balance this one. This is one that you could balance, and you should see that it is indeed balanced. The next question that comes up with this, and hence it's in big words there, you need to be able to predict. You have to predict not only that these are the products of this reaction, but did the reaction actually happen? All right? Which tends to confuse students. Has anybody ever thought about what they would do if they won the lottery? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have won the lottery? Okay. <laughs> Interesting observation. You've thought about what you would do. You've come up with a plan. What is the chemical equation? It is the plan. That is the plan. If these two things get mixed, then this could possibly happen. It does not mean it does happen. 
To know it does happen, I have to pull in some other information, like, let's mix them and see what happens. What's the problem with that for you in the lecture? You can't mix them. Okay? When you move to the lab, you will be doing an experiment like this, where you will test these out. Okay? So what we expect is that you use information that other people have already found. Right? That information is known as the activity series. Right? So you're usually given an activity series. And in fact, one of those little loose single sheets that I gave you that wasn't a note one has an activity series on it, I thought, right? Yeah, it has activity series on it. I'm going to bet, based again on your exam today, that she's probably going to let you use that on your next exam. You should check with her, but I'm going to bet that's the case. Okay? So what we expect you to be able to do is to interpret it. So for that first equation where all my work is now erased, how would I go through and use that? So there's our zinc sulfate plus our lead. Anybody notice anything different about how I just drew that? I swapped them. Am I allowed to do that? Okay. 2 plus 2 equals 1 plus 3, right? Could I have written that, 3 plus 1? Yes. Yeah, same thing with chemistry. Okay. The order doesn't matter there. How do I use the activity series? Do I care about lithium? Why not? It's not on the list. Good, so we can start eliminating things. And ultimately what we need to do is identify the location of zinc and, what's the other one? Lead. Where's lead? There it is. Okay. Now I have to draw an interpretation from the activity series. The high, and because I like positives, that's probably not true, but let's go ahead and say that. Okay. I like positive things. So at the top of this, I am the most active, because right, decreasing activity. So as a most active species, I am more likely, see positive, more, to be in a compound. Which of our species is more likely to be in a compound? The zinc, because it's higher on the activity series. So I'm going to go back to my equation and say, where is zinc in a compound? Is zinc in a compound? No. No. Where is zinc in a compound? There. Right there. Okay. It's in the reaction, yes. Where in the reaction? It would be on the left side of the arrow or the right side of the arrow? The right side, which would make it a product. Okay? Because maybe you're an introvert and you don't like being in a compound with the rest of the world. Okay? So we've got our extroverts up at the top. Okay? Let's see what happens with our introverts at the bottom. Because our introverts don't want to consider themselves in a negative. We'll go again with a positive down there the bottom of our table, we are more likely to be more likely to be alone. Because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to say solo. Okay. Which one is more likely to be solo? Lead. Where is lead by itself in the equation? On the top, yes. Okay. I need more. Right hand side of the arrow. Okay. How do we use this information to decide if the reaction occurs? Okay. When you start a reaction, what do you start with? Reactants. Reactants. So we're starting with these two things. When I mix these two things together, okay, what do they decide to do? Lead wants to be by itself. So what is it going to do? It's going to try to be by itself. In the attempt to be by itself, sulfate feels lonely and needs a little bit of comforting from zinc. And what happens? we get the swap. So we just have to look to see where our stars are. If our stars are on the product side of the equation, did we just win a million dollars? Yeah. Okay. What if the stars are on the reactant side of the equation? If they started out that way, so we're trying to... So if we look at the equation underneath, just accept that this one is balanced. Gold versus copper. What do we do? Gold's at the very bottom, and copper's a little bit above it. Okay. Copper is? More 
Less. More likely to be in a compound. Where is copper in a compound? I'm glad you're entertained by my deletion of all of my work. Copper. <laughs> copper is more likely to be found in a compound. Where is gold? More likely to be by itself. Where is gold by itself? On the reactant side. When I take those reactants and I mix them with each other, what happens? If they swap, what does that mean gold is saying? It wants to be in a compound. Do, does it want to be in a compound? No. no. Does the, that reaction occur? No. 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 That is now no reaction. So realistically, so you're saying if you did this, that's what should happen, but realistically, they're not going to want to do what you're saying should Exactly happen. right. Okay. Right? The chemical equation is the plan. It's not did it actually happen. It's just this what is what would happen. So technically, if you reverse them, then that would be correct. Yes. So if I somehow, instead of mixing gold with copper, I mixed copper with gold sulfate, now I'd get a reaction. Exactly right. Okay. When we look at the next two, become a little bit tricky. Why would the next two become tricky? Well, hydrogen's not a metal. Hydrogen's not a metal. So when I look at that next one, there's an only one metal. It's just zinc. What charge would zinc typically carry? Plus two. Plus two. A positive, right? Positive two. What charge does hydrogen typically carry? A plus one. It's not metals that exchange. It's the similarly charged species that exchange. Which means when we go through and do that reaction, what happens? Zinc exchanges with with hydrogen. Okay, and we get now zinc with sulfate, and we get hydrogen by itself. Notice that it says H two, right? Yeah. Hydrogen gas. And we see H2SO4. Why is the 2 in H2SO4? Because it is balancing sulfate. Why is there a 2 in H2? Because it is a diatomic gas. 2 in the exact same location with entirely different meanings. Last one, why is that one extra confusing? There's only one metal and there's only one positively charged species. Okay, what are we exchanging here? What charge does chlorine typically take? Minus one. Minus one. What charge does iodine typically take? Minus one. Minus one. We're not exchanging the positively charged species. We're exchanging the negatively charged species. It's still a single replacement because we're exchanging one piece into the compound. Okay. It fits the pattern. We can't use that on our activity series. Why can't we use it on the activity series? Hydrogen's on there, so I don't accept that it's not a metal. They're both nonmetals with the same charge? They're both nonmetals and it's really easy. Does that say iodine? No, no. They're not on the chart. You can't use them because they aren't on the chart. Okay. Are they on your chart? I don't know. Take a look. Okay. So you don't have to worry about using them as an activity series. You may still have to worry about them for predicting a product. Okay? We are officially done. I apologize. I talked too long and apparently not enough. So I will let her know where we went ahead and stopped. Um, if you've got more questions.